just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber. You go and do something like this. And totally redeem yourself! <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we just found the front runner for Game of the Year, and I don't think it's getting topped easily. When Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was announced, I think we all rightfully thought that it was gonna be good, if the remake back in 2020 was anything to go by, but my god, I never thought it would be this good. I seriously cannot understate the quality and charm at just everything in this game, especially the story, which is one of the greatest I have ever played in gaming. I thought Remake back in 2020 was a great game and in my opinion was only beat out by Ghost of Tsushima in terms of game of the year. Believe me when I tell you, this game makes Remake look like Forspoken. Did I just do that? Square Enix continues their climb out of the gutter of gamers perception from disaster after disaster and stupid NFT blockchain business plans that nobody asks for and nobody thinks would work. It's pretty clear, Final Fantasy is the MVP of the gaming industry. Without 16 last year and Rebirth this year and 14's ongoing lifespan, Square Enix would be in real trouble. It's almost as if they can't do anything but Final Fantasy. With characters such as this, a story as compelling is this a combat system that in my opinion should be the standard for every Final Fantasy game going forward and truly beautiful women which is the real reason why I'm playing I don't think they need to worry about doing anything but Final Fantasy for a while and for an open world game made by Square Enix the amount of content in this game and fun content too for the most part is staggering considering the quality of the stuff that actually matters but I think you want some details how is Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth so far ahead of the first game and what makes it so engaging and engrossing to play well that chocobo ain't gonna ride itself so strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. If there's one word I can use to describe Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and the one thing it absolutely nails, it's charm. There were very little times where I played a main or a side quest or done a silly minigame where I was not smiling ear to ear. The graphics and motion capture are perfect here, really top of the line stuff, and it adds so much to the experience, especially when it comes to facial animations. Everything about this game finds a way to be endearing in some way. Ugh, nice going, Yuffie. Call the guy a creep, why don't ya? You big moron! Dum, 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 dum. Uh, <laughs> a lot of this has to do with some amazing voice acting across the board. It's like... You've become one with the mountain. Say what? Really? I did? Hey! Thanks for having me! The hell are you doing, Red? Relax. It happens to all the climbers. If she passes out, I'll carry her. Let's go! Or just funny moments with the people you interact with. No need to be shy. We go way back, right? <laughs> it's the least I can do. From over-the-top moments of wannabe Zangief, or Gus, who looks like he was pulled straight from the Saints Row reboot, which I don't really want to be reminded of, to your companions themselves. What? So does that mean I gotta run everything by you first? Yep. So that's the game. Fine. Permission to sing, sir? What? Permission to scratch my back, sir? Permission huh? to blow my nose, sir? Huh? Didn't get permission to yawn yet. Well, do I get permission or not? Sure, you can do it while you're warming the bed. That's an abuse of power! Tyrant! Tyrant! They will go from playful banter back and forth with each other to threatening to chop off Don Corneo's nuts? We cutting them off? <laughs> Or should we rip them off? That or smash them, maybe? <laughs> Let's fill them with lead. Don't bother. I'll just bite them off. Speaking of, every time Tifa and Aerith teamed up to be cute, 
Yeah, it worked. Freeze. Hands up. <laughs> well? Well? You got me. <laughs> the love triangle is real. But it really sucks that these girls really want this threesome, your companions want this threesome, and everyone in their right mind wants this threesome. Except the main character. Oh, lighten up. We're trying to enjoy ourselves. I'm trying to get paid. But speaking of our amazing girl adventures, I would be remiss if I was talking about Charm and didn't mention the entire lead up to the parade, which is one of the best things I've ever seen in gaming. How do you take a recruit your soldiers or recruit your allies mission and make it fun? Well, you start the whole thing off by Cloud and his potential love interest trying to infiltrate Rufus Shinra's welcoming parade, have the girls joke about how he's too close to the stalls when they're changing, Oh man! Pull another cute moment, get caught by your supposed battalion commander, You've got guts skipping out on practice. Hi, Edelgard. Be forced to reenact the formations of the parade, but do it so well that the commander actually makes you captain of the Midgar 7th Infantry. Well, shit, that backfired. Be forced to go recruit your soldiers who are all doing something stupid beforehand. Have the entire battalion you've gathered so far follow you in perfect formation while saluting you whenever you walk back to them. Sir, welcome back, sir. Welcome back, sir. Talk about a real power fantasy. And have one section of soldiers actually be singing in a bar that only serves bald people. Which may or may not include Andrew Tate. Oh, guess we stumbled onto Hustlers University. And all of this works because Cloud was once a Shinra soldier, so he knows the basics. Have you ever been able to describe the steps of a minor recruit mission so thoroughly as I just did and have it be as interesting? No. I didn't think so. Also, this parade theme slaps. Believe me, when Square Enix wants you to smile, you're gonna smile. But I'm not gonna smile as much if I'm not having fun. And this is where we get into the gameplay. For the most part, the combat in Rebirth is the exact same as it was in Remake, which I'm not complaining because why would you complain about something this good? Although I will say one thing, I will always find it hilarious that Cloud has this massive, gigantic buster sword. One hit, tiny bit of damage to a fly. I know there's more that goes into the combat, but I will never not find that funny. It's like, bro, you sure that's not made of plastic? But once you get over that, the combat is still addicting as ever. I mean, when you dodge his cloud and start getting those green blasts, <laughs> Swap into your abilities and materia to see what the enemy's weakness is, realizing you're screwed because you didn't put Assess on Aerith and now you gotta wing it. The one major new combat mechanic is the synergy skills. These were first seen in the Intergrade DLC, which somehow I never got to play, but these are team-up skills between you and your companions. You got some basic team-up attacks and then you have your synergy abilities, where when your meter is fully powered up, you can do special attacks on the level of limit breaks, or particularly with Barrett as I played, raise the amount of ATB you can use, so not only can you dole out abilities faster, but you can dole out more as well. Of course, you still got your summons, which I made the particularly unusual decision to give the most badass character in the game a chocobo summon, and I forgot to change it for the entire game, so Big Bird was always there for me. I always wanted to see a chocobo chocoho. But on the real, games like this and the Tales series continually find new ways to make the process of repeatedly attacking a tanky enemy not get stagnant whatsoever. Also, a little bit of advice. Since I've consistently fallen into this routine, don't be afraid to swap between your other party members during combat. Cloud is still by far the best, 100%. But hey, sometimes you got an airborne enemy, and you might want to use the green blast on him. Or you could just make it easy on yourself and switch to Barret or Aerith. Or just don't be afraid to use other characters in general. Like, I didn't really play as Red 13 a lot in the remake, or a lot in this game either, until I played his trial and realized, yeah, Sidewinder is overpowered. Speaking of tanky enemies, let's talk about these boss fights. Now, icons, they are absolutely not. It's always great fighting giant robot number 37, but the boss fights still feel cool, and the best part, considering Final Fantasy 16, almost none of them overstay their welcome. Although I am getting really tired of whooping the Turks asses. Seriously, guys, what's the score now? I know Hustlers University has a new student, but you haven't told her how things work here, have you, Mr. Tate? But if I may, minor spoiler. The Rufus fight. I hate 
everything about this boss battle. I hate it. I hate it all. I just want to hit him with my plastic sword. Stop blocking me! It doesn't help that Statler and Waldorf over here won't shut up. Shut up! We also... We also... Also... Oh, I'm sorry, did I accidentally fire up Sekiro? When you get away from these giant robots, the bosses become so much more interesting and so much more memorable. Like, it's always been this way, but especially in Rebirth. Like, are you gonna remember this drill boy? Or are you gonna remember the cleric, <clears throat> sorry, Galleon beast fight? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you know the answer to that. And getting a stagger on a boss and then going to town on it is still incredibly satisfying. But all in all, the gameplay is still amazing. And the amount of mechanics involved make it feel fresh almost every time. But this supplements what Rebirth really has new on offer. It's time we discuss the world. So the biggest change that Rebirth made is that now it's open world. You have seven regions to explore with a bunch of different towns in each of them, as well as different open world activities to do. And to do all of this, it would be really weird if he gave you a massive open world and forced you to walk everywhere. I mean, unless you're Dragon's Dogma. But in this case, we'll allow it. So you know what you get, right? Yep, you get to ride a chocobo! Each region has its own chocobo type, one that climbs up walls, one that can jump off mushrooms, or just your basic default one you get initially. To get each one, you have to do a mini game where you gotta sneak up on it while avoiding its friends. And these can get creative, like having to sneak with a moving minecart. Throw this rock here. Yeah, <laughs> boy. I like how you actually have to work to get the chocobos in each region, and it's not just handed to you, because it wouldn't feel the same as actually having to put the work in yourself to catch it. You know, like people do in real life. Now that that part's done, I want to get the bad out of the way real quick, because let's be honest guys, the open world activities are lame. Your assignments are provided by the Fitness Grand Pacer Tip. Oh my god, not you. Aside from finding proto relics, which actually have a mini storyline attached to them, when you're out in the world, these are the things you gotta do. Unlock towers, scan rocks, activate summon crystals, and participate in combat trials. The test will begin in 30 seconds. Line up at the start. Who asked for a sister? I don't even like him. Each one you complete gains you data points to buying more materia, but I'm gonna be real. I didn't find myself needing to buy anything from Chadley, since you could just get the materia from these vending machines next to the benches. So, at least for me, the incentive isn't really there. And if the story is so good that I want to keep playing it, why would I want to stop to do basic busy work? I guess the summon crystals are interesting since the more you find, the less powerful the summon fights in the combat simulator would be, and the stronger they will be once you actually acquire them, but I'd rather just fight them as is, after maybe one? But maybe that's just me, some guys out there may want to go the full 9 miles. It just feels very Ubisoft-y, and I don't think I need to tell you, that's not a compliment. But okay, aside from those, I think it's safe to say, this is a complete and total upgrade over Midgar. Since the first game had to stretch the first part of the original game out, we had to spend the entire 30 plus hours in what was originally a handful of hours. Here, however, the amount of different locations you can go to, they each feel distinct from one another. Rather than, oh hey, another slum, I am absolutely loving the diversity. The work they did on the towns too is impressive. You wanna talk about feeling unique? Places like Calm, which is just a converted castle town. Very cool aesthetic. Hey, nice fort you got here. What a glorious wall. Keep Junon, Gungaga. Me? Gungaga. But just the town. The rest of this place can go to hell. And especially Costa del Sol and the Gold Saucer, which are by far the best areas in the game. And dare I say it, when I come here, I don't want to leave? I absolutely love what Square did to make each one feel alive and unique, if not just a blast to explore. Each one also has its own side missions that the first game had, and for all the ones I did, every one of them was charming in its own way. Like trying to help clones of Johnny, fighting off monsters as frogs? What? And an absolutely shitty escort mission with a dog. Never mind, this mission rules. Side note, I was playing Persona 5 Royal in between making reviews for this and Dark Souls 2, so every time I hear Kyrie, I can't stop picturing on Takamaki. Stop the ship! I have a ticket! Oh no! I didn't mean to push him so hard. Are you okay? Wake up! 
Each of the side missions is also once again attached to one of your companions, but in Rebirth, we have relationships. And each mission you do with the respective companion increases your relationship meter with them, also raised by doing synergy attacks with them. Now, what does this do exactly? Well, nothing. Except determining who you're going to go on a date with at the Golden Saucer. So I did every single one involving Tifa and Aerith, but preferably Tifa. So I made a conscious effort to please her. Get in here, Barrett. The events at the Gold Saucer are also just great and made me wish, can we please just get another Star Fox game, please? But make sure whoever you're going on that final date with, you have maxed out their relationship or else. What? Well, good thing I saved. I did not put Aerith on the bench and grind all that time just to get an awkward friendship hug. A few moments later. <laughs> You also have different mini games such as Target Practice, literally Clash Royale, but probably the best activity in Rebirth is a little game known as Queen's Blood. I decided to not learn the game at the start because I am here to kill and simp, not play cards, until we got to Chapter 5 and I had to participate in a Queen's Blood tournament. You could say I learned on the job. Current projections show my victory is all but sure. Hey Chadley, how long do your projections say it'll take for me to smash your head through a window? But I went from hating Queen's Blood to absolutely loving Queen's Blood. And it became all I did. Basically the way it works is that you and your opponent have reserved spaces to put cards down with different point values. Each one has different abilities such as making new reserve spaces or lowering the power of other cards. But each space has a space value and each card needs to go with its respective value. But some cards can convert your spaces into their own so you need to push them back as much as you can. Now, I may have just explained the basics to you, but you will not truly learn until you play, preferably after you've gotten your ass kicked by the, the femboy cyborg. But as you play more and more in the world, you start to unravel the dark history of the game and find a conspiracy surrounding an evil queen. Like, that wasn't needed, but holy crap, am I here for it? Whenever you want a break from the story, there will always be something for you to do in the Rebirth, and most of the time, it's something that you will have a blast with. But that may be hard because who would want to be ripped away from a story that is this great? So this is where we get into spoilers, and as always, if you don't want to know what happens, skip to this timestamp. Alright, let's roll. Now full disclosure, I have never played the original game, I just played Remake and this, so I don't know if what was made here was made by either Square Enix or Square Soft. So if things are different, I'm not going to be the guy that point out any but one of these things. I can only judge what is being put in front of me. And what was put in front of me was one of the best stories I have seen in a very long time. As things have somewhat cooled off with Shinra after the events of Remake, the gang is now searching for Sephiroth all over the world while still trying to find a way to save the life stream of the planet. While Shinra is now reworking under the leadership of Rufus Shinra after his dad's death in the first game. And he has to deal with a potential war with Wutai if things break out. But don't worry, he's surrounded by truly unlikable rats people. Like this. And Principal Kabayakawa if he had hair. But back to the people that actually matter. The gang catches a break as now they have a clue to Sephiroth's whereabouts in the form of the monks from Monty Python. <laughs> Apparently these black robed men aimlessly wander towards where Sephiroth is. So the gang decides to track them across the world, even to the beach where people have the appropriate reaction. You're freaking everyone out. For real, take a hike. It is also vitally important that the crew stop Sephiroth because he is looking for black materia, which he will use to destroy the world. The game shows his descent into insanity five years ago once he discovers he's a creation of Genova, and now he seeks to bring death to the world, causing him to completely destroy Nibelheim and killing everybody in sight in a sequence that is perfection. If you can get over the fact that you're slowed to a snail's pace. I, I think you guys should just shoot him now. I, I don't think he's surrendering. Oh, 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 there goes that. It's here that I should mention the best part about this story, and that is Cloud. Throughout the game, he's constantly struggling with degradation, which is a condition that happens to all soldiers because of their genetic enhancements, basically turning them into mindless husks. They lose their minds, memories, their sense of who they are, and their sole purpose is to seek Sephiroth. 
which means all of these black robed men are former soldiers. Just like the first game, Sephiroth is toying with Cloud's head, but in Rebirth, it gets bad. The degradation has gotten to a point where Sephiroth is basically influencing Cloud throughout the game. He's putting false notions in his head that Tifa is an imposter because he saw Sephiroth kill her five years ago. Even though she's got the scar to prove it, he makes him go berserk on enemies, influencing what he says and how he acts, even getting him to literally turn on Tifa. Whoa, 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 hold up. Now, this might be a nitpick, but how is Tifa not cleaved in half? Either this girl's abs are made of steel, or this sword really is plastic. Okay, I looked it up, and uh, apparently that was a dodge backwards, so... That could have been edited better. Not to mention, all of this makes Cloud exhausted afterwards and unable to do anything. It really raises the stakes of the story because it turns the moment from, oh, Cloud's having another episode, to, oh shit, is something about to go down? Is he about to turn on someone else? By the end of the game, he is an angry, tunnel-visioned drone. No nonsense, stop dicking around, we need to find Sephiroth and the Black Materia. Get your asses moving. Even after Aerith gives this really inspiring speech on life and death, Cloud's just like, Are you finished? And when he's fully turned into Sephiroth's puppet, he sounds like a damn serial killer. You can trust me. Let's save the planet together. Aerith! What they did with Cloud's transition into the degradated husk is absolute perfection. I can't remember a game where I was so on edge and scared of a main character like this snapping at the wrong moment. But it's not just Cloud who gets great moments. Everybody in this game gets something to deepen their character. Barrett's arc in this game is also perfection. Him coming to terms with his past failures and the destruction of his hometown. His final moments with Dine honestly made me tear up. And if you were to tell me before I started playing that something involving this badass would make me cry, I would have thought you had Mako poisoning. Probably the most forgettable character in Remake, Red 13, gets a whole chapter dedicated to him becoming the guardian of Cosmo Canyon, where he learns the true history of his family and that his father wasn't a deadbeat like he thought. Also, he shows his true voice. Hey, guys, it's me. Yep, that is absolutely Ryuji. Upon Tifa taking a lore accurate hit from a buster sword, she rides the East Australian Current, where she's basically in limbo and reliving old memories of herself and Cloud when they were kids. Even things that Cloud himself doesn't even remember, deepening their relationship, which might need some work after what just happened. Yuffie doesn't get a big memorable arc, but she's just Yuffie. Newcomer Kate Sith has a bunch of up and downs throughout the game, being a Shinra infiltration pawn. But hey, I'm not gonna say no to a Scottish voice actor. Mummy, Ming, murder it. It's all on the table. In summary, prepare yourselves for one seriously cold reception. Fucking go, let's go! We also got the introductions of Sid Highwind and Vincent Valentine. Though they're not playable characters in this one like they were in the original, that's changing next game. But the one thing I knew about from the original game, and what everyone who played it was sweating about, is how this game would handle Aerith. Specifically, her death. And I, for one, love how they handled her throughout the game. Eh, right up until the end. The game did the trope that a lot of different games or movies do, where you have a character that is so pure and nice, charming, and just a bundle of joy, that it's almost obvious that something bad is going to happen to them. But you don't strike me as the type to care all that much. I don't. Food's food. Uh-oh. Don't you know what happens to people who say they don't care what their food tastes like? They spontaneously combust. You're screwing with me, right? I guess we'll see, won't we? They're building all that up just to tear it down and make you cry. And for everyone who was playing up until now, I think everyone knew that Aerith was still gonna go out. Even Aerith herself had this feeling. In the original game, the death was a complete shock to everyone. But in Rebirth, it feels like she's known this all along, and she's pretty much seeing this as a sort of sacrifice. Because as the last remaining Cetra, she's the only one that can summon the Force to stop the meteor that Sephiroth wants to summon. She even tells Cloud in the dream sequence, 
But there was still hope. There was still tiny feelings that this time they were going to save Aerith. Especially towards the end where pretty much everyone in the party knows what's about to happen. Honestly, for me, the way things were going, I was scared that they were going to have Cloud Killer instead. But despite knowing this, you still can't save her. Which is where things get funky. I'm gonna be real. At first, I thought Cloud just underestimated the gigantic length of Sephiroth's blade. But then looking back, apparently it has to do with the fact that the timelines have become all messed up because of the stuff with the Whispers. And even though he technically saved her, the timelines somehow converged to where now the turn of events is Sephiroth actually killing Aerith. And now Cloud can see multiple timelines at once, which is why he could see Aerith and that yellow streak in the sky when everyone else can't. What the hell is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. Honestly, it took a sad moment for me while I was playing and turned it into a befuddled mess once I looked into it more. The game built up Aerith's character and built to this moment so well that once it got there, it feels like it fumbled the ball in terms of explaining things. I can only imagine what fans of the original game must be thinking with this. You probably should have just had Cloud have an episode during the struggle that lets his guard down for a split second, allowing for Sephiroth to fully stab Aerith. That would have made much more sense than this. It's a shame that I figured this out after the fact, because once the credits rolled, I felt like this was a perfect ending. But now, not so much. There is one other thing I want to say, and my other general problem with this game, as I have few. Everyone who's watching this and has played Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I ask you this. Did Zack really need to be in this game? Up until the very end where he helps out with a phase of Sephiroth's boss fight, I never once felt that he added anything meaningful to the story. After the timelines become fractured and he survives his would-be death, in his timeline, everything has gone to shit. The world is ending, the gang is either captured or knocked out, and the majority of the time he's caring for Cloud and Aerith. But the small sections we get of him are him just walking in and out of Aerith's house, speaking to Biggs, walking around Sector 5, and I'm thinking, is something actually going to happen here? But nothing does, up until the very end. Even the foreshadowing we get from his scenes feel like they don't really need to be here. Everything about the story of Rebirth was so amazing that every time we cut back to Zack, it felt like the story just took a full time out. The only reason why I can think he was in the game is to show the effect of the timeline changes, but if you're gonna do this, you gotta make it more interesting than this. I shouldn't be groaning every time this guy shows up. Granted, it's very little, but it's something that has to be said. I know this section ended on a down note, but aside from that, the story of Rebirth is something that is impossible not to remember, and one of the best experiences I've had with video game storytelling, despite those two problems I have with it. With all of this being said, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was way better than I thought it would be. And that's saying a lot. It's one of those rare games where once I finished, I was actually upset that it was over. And when you can make me feel that, you know you belong among the greats. It's not a perfect game by any means, but it does so many things, not just right, but exceptional. So much so that you can overlook most of the stumbles along the way. I wasn't giddy about what would come next when I beat Remake, but after playing this, I am stoked to see how this story ends. Although God help me if I have to fight the damn Turks again. I know this review may differ from some fans of the original, especially when it comes to the story, but in my eyes, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is an instant classic, and everybody at Square Enix who worked on this game should be proud of themselves. This final Sephiroth boss fight is about to be insane. Without question, my frontrunner for Game of the Year, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth gets a 9.5 out of 10.